Hey, this is John Greathouse. I'm super stoked to talk to Nate Lowry. Um, he is an inventor, but he's also the founder and CEO of Brazen Life. So before Brazen, um, you might have guessed from Nate Shirt, he, he was an All-American tight end at Yale, uh, graduated and was, and was drafted in, uh, by the Bucs into the NFL, ended up having an uh, eight-year career in the NFL. And as we're going to see, his NFL career is very tightly tied to his entrepreneurial journey, but I'm not going to give that away yet. So Nate, welcome. Good to, good to talk to you. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to talk to me, John. This is, this is awesome. So I, I want to start kind of at the beginning. Like I'm, I'm often, uh, it's often interesting to understand as a child, like what was your, what was your, you know, were your parents, I know obviously you, you performed at the highest levels athletically. So they supported you in that regard. Were they supportive of sort of your entrepreneurial bent? Like, were you that kid that was always hustling or how, how was the home life coming up? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I always kind of say that I'm a made entrepreneur. Um, I think growing up, I was just so focused on sports. I love sports. Yeah. Um, you know, dreamed of playing in the NFL or the NBA, you know, as a, as a young kid and knew that I, I just, you know, I was going to be tall enough to be able to play t potentially at that kind of level and had the athletic ability as a kid. And I was so focused on sports. Um, I did love building things as a kid. So I was, the, you know, the kid, I'd come home from, you know, whatever practice, get my homework done and then go into the basement and just, you know, work on building models or model rockets or um, playing with trains and constantly building things as a kid. Um, and I think that translated over uh, quite a bit as I, as I got older. I mean, I, I continued to, to love to do that, that kind of thing. But I never had the I never had the lemonade stand or anything like that. Right. I, I think just because I was so focused on you know trying to be a great athlete and putting putting my efforts into the sports and then yeah um, yeah it's interesting I think through playing in the NFL so graduated from Yale went on to the NFL um, in the off seasons you you have this big chunk of time where you know, you're kind of self-directed on what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a guy that was constantly like struggling and constantly uh, working to get on the roster, you know what I mean? Yep. It was on me to go out and find the best trainers or to find, you know, to, to go out and do the track workouts and to improve myself. So when I did get back into the gym or when I did get back into the team environment, I was more prepared. And I think that um, kind of that self-directed, uh, need to go out and perform and to get better and to um, kind of separate myself from the competition, which are other guys that are either on your team or out there looking to be on a team really kind of taught me this entrepreneurial spirit of like, yep. let's go and be more creative and do things a little bit different and uh, do things a little bit better or harder or faster. And um, getting out and having that, you know, that, that period where it's like, now I'm, you know, I'm leaving the show, I'm running the show, um, I think inspired me to kind of like want to pursue that after I retired. Yeah, I mean, I, I've interviewed a number of people over the years that, you know, both as an entrepreneur myself, hiring people and, and, and now in, in, as a professor and being able to, to talk to entrepreneurs. And it's, it, I guess I'm not surprised anymore, but the general populace might be surprised. A number of athletes, I mean, you were at the top, right? So not everyone's a professional athlete. But a lot of people play D1 or D2 and that, I think that discipline and that drive and that focus and like that, you know, just hitting it hard um, all the time, it so easily translates into entrepreneurship because, you know, it's about, you know, nobody really cares. You just have to deliver. Like, it's not like nobody's yeah. going to do you a favor. Like, if you've got a great product with a great value prop, then wonderful. But if you don't, you got to work on it. Make sure you get yeah. it. So let's let's talk a little bit about that transition. So I, I know you were injured. I think in your third year, a pretty debilitating, serious um, injury. And as part of your therapy, you know, you didn't give up. You didn't like throw in the towel. You you wanted to, to stay there and, and make it work. Uh, so part of your therapy, as I understand it, was um, obviously using a foam roller. It wasn't as if you never you had used one before, but right. um, I understand you kind of hooked up with somebody who was. Um, you know, using it in, in unique and different ways. And mm -hmm. I've, I've read that you you attribute your next five seasons in the NFL, maybe not solely to the roller, but it was, you know, it was, a, it was part of your story. 
how do you get, so I want to hear a little bit about that therapy, but then how it's one thing to be impressed by a device. It's another thing to retire and then decide, you know what? I got so much out of this foam roller as a, you know, elite athlete. I want to bring that to other people. So you did a Kickstarter, you raised 65 K like what was, what caused you to, to make that leap into, you know, full on entrepreneurship? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess a lot to kind of unpack there. Um, yeah. So sorry, that was a, that was a, that was a narration <laughs> rather than a no, question. No, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah. So I guess one was the, the realization that these tools are very helpful and it was helpful for me as an athlete. So, um, yeah, my third year I was playing with the saints. I had a, a really bad back injury. It was actually something that I felt coming out of training camp, just kind of pain in my low back, mm. um, continue to play through it and seeing it get worse and worse throughout the season. At the same time, I was getting more and more playing time. So pushing myself harder to just ignore it and try to get through the season. Um, it was part of, you know, the team. Uh, and it was also the season was kind of interesting because it was that first year post Katrina mm -hmm. when the Saints were coming back from, uh, they had been dislocated to San Antonio the year before because of Katrina. They were coming back in, coming back to the dome. New Orleans was just like, Totally. The people of New Orleans were just trying to figure out their lives and rebuilding. And all of a sudden, the Saints, who have, you know, always been kind of the, the butt of the NFL, um, are now good. And they yeah. those fans were always so so engaged to begin with. And they just wanted a team and they just kind of aligned with the season. Yep. And so I was I was kept pushing myself through this like debilitating back thing um because I wanted to be a part of that too, you know. Sure. So um and then ended up needing to have surgery recovering and yeah it kind of was taught i like yeah like you said i had used foam rollers before but not as like a consistent thing mm -hmm. uh and it was more kind of the mindset of like okay if i get on this device i can stretch in certain ways i can loosen up muscles that are um you know that have some sort of adhesions or are or sore for whatever reason because i'm overtraining them or uh, my body's not aligned perfectly. And there's all these different things that you can do with the foam roller if you know how to use it to keep your body aligned, to keep it healthy, keep the muscles uh, and the fascia working properly. And yeah, so I, you know, I was using it all the time and was kind of annoyed that this, I had this big bulky cylinder. Right. That I couldn't, you, were you, know. you like traveling with it? Like literally like carrying it around? Or how yeah. Did you yeah. I mean, that was the, that was the, constant debate you know I travel a lot in the offseason sure. you know so part of the other side of you know why I built the brand is I love to travel I love adventure I love going and visiting new places um, but at the same time the need to train it's the need to keep take care of, taking care of my body was important and so there would be this debate do I pack this big cylinder or do I leave it yeah a lot of times I would leave it and I'd come back and I felt like my body was now kind of in a worse position um, so I wanted to maintain that and yeah, just kind of had this concept while I was playing of making a foam roller that could be put in a backpack. And, you know, if I could do that, that would be pretty awesome. I'd love to have that tool in my backpack whenever. Um, yeah, so kind of stowed that away, uh, retired, took over a, a family business mm. that um, was kind of selling uh, products. It was uh, mostly wholesale business. It's uh, storm door hardware. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of took that business and redirected it towards more direct to consumer stuff mm -hmm. um, because I saw like where Amazon was going and the ability and we had a lot of units out there and that um, there's potential in this business to be a, a good direct to consumer business. Um, so kind of redirected that and worked and learned how that kind of business worked. And, um, but something, you know, as a product line that I wasn't super passionate about, you know, mm -hmm. my, my whole thing was like, I love sports. Um, I like, love training. I love, you know, I want to help people stay on the field, feel better. And uh, I had this idea. So just kind of prototyped it and tinkered with it for a long time. Uh, and then it got, finally got to the point where it's like, this thing could be an actual product in the world. And I think it should be because I love it. And, and uh, yeah, so we decided to run the Kickstarter. So that, it's funny because it, that's a common theme, especially with first products is, people solving a problem they have, right? It's right. it's not sitting down and going, hmm, like, like what problem do other people have that I, I mean, that can work too, but oftentimes it's, 
look, yeah, I want to, I want to help other people, but right now I got to deal with this. Um, I've talked, you know, I've talked to a number of entrepreneurs where their, their first product was something they needed. And then of course yep. other people needed it too. So, so I, I, I love that you made the leap because that's never easy. I mean, that's pretty, you know, you put yourself out there hundred um, percent. And I, the other thing I, I really like about your brand and, and, the, and the family of products that you're building is, is sort of that ethos uh, that you've created. And I'm going to read it because I don't want to mess it up. So uh, Brazen's ethos is to boldly, unabashedly and fearlessly live life and to live a brazen life. So I'm curious, how is that manifested itself in your culture? Like with your employees, like how do we see that in, you know, beyond the words. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, um, so like I said, I, I, one thing is I love to travel. I think there's so much value of going out and exploring the world and, you know, meeting people from different cultures mm-hmm. and it just expands your brain, expands your, your thinking because you see that there's not one way of doing things and there's not right. one way of thinking about things. Um, and yeah. And I love to see those of like, putting yourself out there and, and just going for it. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, part of that is being outside of your comfort zone and um, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. And I think athletes know that, right. It's, as you, as you progress through your athletic career, you're working out harder, you're training harder, you're pushing your body, you're sore. Um, and you, you push through it because, you want to see what you can accomplish. You want to see, you know, what the end of that road looks like as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Um, So all that kind of gets wrapped up into this idea of living a brazen life, which is really just to go for it. Um, And as an entrepreneur, it's the same thing, you know, taking that leap from uh, an athlete to potentially going and working in for an office to, no, I want to go do this myself and see what I can create. That, that takes a, a leap of faith and a leap, a, a bold move to go out and just see what you can do. And that's kind of what the brand is about and trying to inspire that and really to try to create tools to help people go and do that. Mm-hmm. So creating tools that can be put in a backpack or put in a carry on. Mm-hmm. So that now as you're going out and, and trying to accomplish that, you have ways to take everybody to feel better and to um, push yourself to that next level. Yep. Well, I, I, I want to I wanna segue to, to something else I found intriguing about your story. So, uh, you know, some entrepreneurs spend years trying to get on Shark Tank, right? They're like, they're like, what is it going to take? Like, I'll do anything. And you had a little different path. I, I'd love for you to share your path to Shark Tank uh, right. and then maybe any lessons learned, you know, now that you can look back. And by the way, anyone watching this, I encourage you Google uh, the, I, I can't remember now, season nine, episode season nine. seven. Yeah, yep, that's right. Good. Yeah, so I get lucky sometimes. So anyway, Google it and, and check it out. Especially after watching this, I think you'll find it. You'll find it interesting. But what was the what was that path? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I think as an entrepreneur or somebody that's um, starting a business, creating a business, um, you kind of you get lucky sometimes, and you, your hard work uh, sometimes leads to opportunities. Um, and this was kind of a combination of both, I guess. Uh, so I had done, I'd done a, a program through Babson College, um, and mm. the the person that was putting on the the seminar, I guess, uh, his name was is Angelo Santinelli, uh, has become an advisor for Brazen. Uh, we just had a, a really good connection. He had a long history of, um, you know, kind of being on boards and uh, kind of guiding entrepreneurs and. Um, we just had an instant connection. And, uh, so I asked him to be part of it and it was just one of those things where he knew a guy that knew one of the producers, they sent some emails, um, made an introduction. And then, uh, I think they had kind of seen the backstory of Brazen and the fact that I played in the NFL and I created this product because it was something that I desperately needed as a player. And, um, yeah, so we got into the, we got into that environment and into that ecosystem uh through a connection uh which just happened to be kind of lucky you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and it was it was kind of one of those things where like you say people will pitch and they'll send uh videos and they'll go through the whole process and it takes a long time and there's thousands and thousands of of companies out there that are trying to get on shark tank um and yeah we were able to kind of use a connection to uh 
at least get it in front of their eyes. And um, yet yeah, within like six weeks of that initial email or call, nice. uh, we were standing in front of the sharks uh, <laughs> doing our pitch and it just happened super fast. So wow. it was it was an interesting and a really cool experience. I mean, you know, you mentioned luck and, and certainly I've been very fortunate and been very lucky many times, but you also have to execute, you have to deliver on that luck, right? So you were, sure. you were in the right place at the right time, but then you made the most of that opportunity. So what, what it kind of, I mean, you don't have to disclose specific numbers, but like give us a sense for the impact on your business from, from that experience and anything you might've done differently now that you've had the chance to look back on it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh... I guess probably looking back, I, I would have sought out a little bit more information early on uh, on how like the post process works. Mm. Um, and so everything you see on Shark Tank is legit. They're, you know, the, the sharks are seeing those businesses for the first time. Um, they actually will cut down like maybe a 45 minute to an hour long pitch into the 12 minute segment that you see. So there's a lot of back and forth going and they have to make a decision in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then Going out of that, you don't know how long it's going to take until the show actually airs, if it actually will air. Right. Um, and we should have, you know, from the day we left, the next day we should have been um, scaling up our production uh, with the idea that maybe we could air at the beginning. And, and we did that, but it kind of took us a little bit longer um, to, to get the process rolling. And so when we went into Shark Tank, we had sent out an email to... Uh, our customers, our current customer base, and just saying, "Hey, we're about to be on Shark Tank. If you want, you know, if you want some to get some rollers, uh, order them now because we expect that we'll be out of stock for a while." Mm. And we actually sold out of our last piece of it oh, no. like two hours before the the first episode aired, uh, and we were able to take pre-orders. So we still had, you know, kind of an amazing response. Uh, it was a really fun uh, experience to just kind of see uh, that translate over from it's on air and you know with with shopify we have a shopify store uh, you have all these tools on the back end that you can see you know how many visitors there are and you, you have this live view uh, of your store and just to see you know thousands and thousands of people come in every couple of seconds and just yeah it's, it was wild but um yeah so Having more inventory and being prepared for that would have been a big thing. I think we um, we were out of stock for, uh, so they aired us and then they re-aired us again like two months later while we were still catching up from the initial uh, surge of, of Shark Tank orders. And in, in total, I think we were on back order for like six to eight months, something like that. Wow. wow. So, which is, which is a bummer because it definitely stalled our momentum a little bit um so that was a big that was a big thing um so if anyone out there that sees this is is looking at being on shark tank make sure you have stock when you're here <laughs> <laughs> yeah but then but then you I, we're not going to mention who i'm not going to mention who it is but we have a mutual friend who they he he his company was even in the promo for the cup coming season and they didn't air his episode so even at the mm -hmm. you don't really know until you're on the air right so there's always that Right. Always a chance, right? Yep. It's television. Yep, exactly. You can't control it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and, and then there's that long tail benefit of Shark Tank. I, I, One of my former students was on years ago, and I, I was just sitting there flipping through the channels, and, you know, there he was. And I, it, literally, that had to have been, like, the second or third season. Like, it was a long time ago. Uh, and so yeah. I, I texted him, and I'm like, dude, you, you know, I'm sure you get these emails all the time, or text all the time i just saw you and he's like yep every time it it airs you know we can see the list so oh for sure the gift yeah. that keeps on giving yeah that's nice exactly so i want to ask you a little bit about um we're going to date this video by talking about covid but it's such a it's obviously had such an impact on everyone so mm -hmm. i find it interesting your, your flagship product you know morph the morph roller was built for portability built for travel built for the person on the go now we find ourselves where nobody's traveling but at the same time, we found during COVID that people were bulking up on home gym equipment. So I'm curious, like what impact COVID had on you and your business? And then what did you do to mitigate like the non people not traveling, but maximize the fact that people were building up their home gyms? Sure. Yeah, I mean, definitely we, we try to um, change our message a little bit. Our, the core value proposition is and, and always will be uh, the portability. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, we think of our customer as the traveling businessman, um, the 
team athlete, right? So teams that are, are traveling to the games a lot, um, the triathlete that's going to different competitions or the, the marathon runner. Um, so travel is, and portability and taking care of your body on the road or any place you'd be going to is a big element of, um, it's a big, it's the main value proposition for the morph. Mm -hmm. um, and that went away almost completely. So we, we did see uh, a drop last year. At the same time, you know, there's this other value proposition of, you know, wanting to keep a decluttered space. Uh, if you have a big foam cylinder in the middle of your room, it's not the nicest to look at. Um, so our product can, can slip under the couch or under the chair. It's out of the way, but it's, it's close at hand so that you can, you know, do your mobility practice whenever you want. Mm -hmm. But still, um, you know, at the same time, we did see a slowdown and, and we're kind of like, you know, a little bit frustrated that we didn't get to participate in this huge home fitness uh, boom. But at the same time, it kind of gave us a, a little bit of perspective to look at the products that we had in our pipeline that, that we had been meaning to develop. Um, but we were so focused on, you know, growing this one product and, you know, increasing the supply chain and making sure that we could uh you know go into new markets and that kind of thing uh to kind of take take a step back and uh to kind of actually start the development process for these this next generation of bracing products and, and so that was really good that um that kind of motivated us to um look to what's next and yeah so we have a few things now that we're working on launching that i'm i'm really excited about i think they have massive potential yeah, good. Was I mean, it's like making you know lemonade out of lemons. Like, you know, the yeah. fact that you had that slowdown caused you gave you a chance to be a little more strategic instead of just focusing on the tactical. Sure. Yeah, the, you know, good for you. Um, I I, I want to ask you about this project. Is it Mika M I K A that you've got? Like, how do you have time for that? First off, uh, and <laughs> and I'd love to hear like I can understand what drove you to it because it's you know helping reduce uh, CO two. Yes. Um, but tell us a little bit about that project yeah. so that folks okay. folks watching this can maybe check it out on their own. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah, it's been a couple of years in development. I've been more involved with it really over the last couple of months. Um, it's called Project MICA. And it's kind of this, uh, it's kind of a new approach really to fighting climate change uh, through wildfire suppression. So people talk about wildfires as kind of a symptom of climate change. And that's true. Um, they're, you know, they're getting bigger, they're getting hotter, um, they're burning more acreage and they're being more devastating. So people really focus on the devastation, the smoke and the air quality and what that does to, you know, people around the globe. Yep. Um, at the same time, fires are putting off up to 20 to 25% of CO2 emissions. Um, uh, so annual GHG, um, it's contributed 20% by, by wildfires. Um, wow. So it's this massive chunk that nobody's really approaching to um, use as a means of fighting climate change. And the reason for that is we don't have the technology to put out fires. So a fast spreading fire and high wind conditions with a lot of smoke, we don't have the assets to actually go and stop those early on when it's easy to put out. Right. And that's why you see these fires growing bigger um, and being more devastating. Uh, and there's, I could go very deep on like why this is, but the, the, the main thing is that water bombers, right? They fly in a horizontal direction. They let out this massive amount of water, but they can't fly low enough or slow enough to get the concentration to put out the fire. So the Project MICA is a new approach to putting out fire where it uses kind of a drone that would be dropped out of the back of a C-130, mm. tethered to a huge water bag, and it goes into a dive bombing maneuver and puts a high concentration of water on a high intensity fire. And then you can blot out the, the fire line through the system and through a kind of a systematic approach to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so the cool thing is with uh, this concept is because it's putting out fires by aerial means alone, you can now address fires in places where there was no natural fire cycle before, but we're seeing big fires. So like Siberia or the Amazon or Indonesia, yep. places that yep. didn't have a natural fire cycle, but now they're having these massive CO2 releasing events. The only way to address those because they're really, you know, mostly unpopulated areas 
is to go fly a plane to them and drop a bunch of water and have this systematic approach where you can get enough planes in the area dropping water and attacking them early. And if you do that, you know, there's that 20% of, of CO2 that right. nobody's looking at, at, at reducing because we can't currently put them out, um, that becomes available. And yeah, I don't know, I was looking at a report earlier from uh, the IPCC that, uh, so this is like the UN climate change uh, report and they just updated, a, they, they put out a, a report in February that, um, that said that we're like 45% short by 2030 of the reduction that we need to be doing. So they have the projected amount of CO2 that we're gonna release yep. and then they have where we need to be to, to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And basically we fall or we're projected to fall 45% short. So there's a huge need to have new tools to, to basically take out CO2 from you know, our, our annual global emissions. Yeah, well, and then there's all the other, I mean, I, I'm in Southern California as you are, and I, I've been evacuated five times. I mean, my house yeah. literally twice, I thought, okay, you know, I got the stuff I need and it's just stuff and all that. And, but fortunately it didn't burn, but houses <laughs> right next to me have. so. It not only is it a is it a you totally. know, advancement for for you know reducing carbon emissions, but also you know can you can save livelihoods. Live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And those fires are like the ones in California are incredibly costly. So I mean, right. you'll see reports that you know a certain fire season costs the economy hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Um, you know, with kind of we're in this this space where we now have space tourism is becoming a thing. We're talking about putting man on Mars, um, but we're just ignoring uh, putting out fires because it's never been done. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, we've talked to a lot of we've talked to a lot of uh, long term career firefighters, and their impression is that you know they know it to their core that you can't put out a, a fire by aerial means alone. But that's just because we've never done it. I, I think that if we can put man on Mars, we can put out fires at home. Mm -hmm. And if we stop them early enough, then you stop these massive CO2 releasing events. And at the same time, you preserve that, you know, that vegetation's ability to continue to process air and take CO2 out. Right. So there's all these, you know, downstream benefits. And then obviously for California or, or Australia, you want it to protect life and property. So there's, you know, there's two kind of buckets that this technology falls in. Yeah, um, and the life and property one is just as important, I think. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're putting, you know, your <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit and, and we'll uh, resources yeah. behind it because yeah, we absolutely need it. We, you know, and, and what I, and, and I do encourage folks watching this to, to check out the site because even there was even statistics on there I wasn't aware of the fact that when permafrost uh, burns the organic material has, hasn't burned before so there's so much more emissions that that, that are admitted as opposed to you know forest that maybe has kind of burned over the years so right uh, it's a real issue I'm glad yeah. you, know, you and, and, the, and the other MICA folks are, are focusing on that yeah yeah I mean like I said we could talk for a long time about this but you know uh, and there's one direction of uh, firefighting that wants to, to actually burn more, to do more prescribed burnings. Uh -huh. And I think that that is, um, that's totally valid because you can, you can control a fire or you can, you can take out fuel when the conditions are good and you can try to put it out. So actually Project Mica would be a good asset in that condition. Mm -hmm. So they don't, you know, get out of control and right. you have accidents, which has happened. Sure. Um, but yeah, our, our perspective is that like we need to protect these forests of planetary interest um, and allow, you know, try to take out this this massive chunk of CO2 that we have to, you know, to, to reduce in a, in a pretty uh, timely manner. So yeah. it's yeah. a pretty cool project. It has huge uh, implications, but there's a there's a long way to go with it. Yeah, good. Well, again, I'm glad that you're focused on it. Um, Thank you. We need it. Well, thanks again. I know you're super busy, Nate. I know you've got a lot going on. And so I really appreciate your time. And I encourage everyone to check out Embrace in Life. Check out uh, the, 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 we just talked about the roller, but you have other products. And I know you have other products of the pipeline uh, and check yep. out Project um, Project Mica as well and see you yep. know, if you can somehow get involved there. Uh, sure. We'll all benefit. Thanks again, Nate. Thank Take you care. so much. Appreciate yep. it, John. Bye-bye.